Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my definitive review of the new Fujifilm X-T5 APS-C camera. And of course, the headline feature here is that it has been upgraded in the, the X-T series has been upgraded in the X-T5 to the new 40.2 um, megapixel X-Trans sensor that was first seen in the X-H2. And so this is a serious powerhouse in terms of performance and a whole lot of different areas that we will explore as a part of today's review. Part of that move to that sensor is another welcome um, shift, and that is from moving from a sens base ISO sensitivity of 160 down to 125 here. And that has a few really measurable payoffs that we're going to see a little bit later on in our image quality section. Along with that, we have got improved video specs, we've got improved in-body image stabilization, improved tracking, and a more compact size. So a lot of uh, positives in the balance sheet, and in today's review, we're going to take a deep dive into the features, into the autofocus performance, the sensor performance, all of those things, and hopefully come to a conclusion that will help you make a buying decision. First, however, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber, and use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So if you are familiar at all with the X-T4, then you are going to be pretty much instantly familiar with the X-T5 because the only difference really that has happened there, there's a couple of my, very, very minor differences, but in terms of the basic layout of the, the controls and the features, they are virtually identical, although the X-T5 has been very slightly shrunken down in its dimensions, moving back towards the er an earlier point in the series as you know it kind of subsequently grew over several generations, they're wrapping that back a little bit. And I think what I have noted in the X-T5 is that maybe there are a, a few areas where there is some intentional separating between the X-T series and then the higher H our XH series. And so I think that they're working to create a little bit more market separation. And so part of that is a little bit of a downsizing here of this particular model. And so now we have a camera that is 130 millimeters wide, 91 millimeters tall, and 64 millimeters deep. And I noted that the only spec that is the same as the X-T4 is the depth of that grip. The one area where I would say you certainly don't want to cut it back any further. And so if you're thinking more in Imperial, that is 5.1 inches by 3.6 inches by 2.5 in depth. It weighs in at 557 grams or 16.8 ounces, meaning that we've shaved off about 50 grams of weight from the X-T4. Outside of that, as noted, the control scheme is the exact same. And so, as before, we have three primary dials across the top. Two of those dials are two-layer dials, and so the one on the far left is the dial that uh, allows you to control ISO, but on the bottom half, it allows you to control your various drive settings. And so, choosing if you're going to do continuous high or low, uh, HDR, things like that. On the, on the other side of the viewfinder port, we have the shutter speed control dial, and on the bottom of that, you can choose between a stills and a movie setup. And one thing that I will say that uh, has become kind of the overall trending camera design, but one that I really like, is that you can have a fully individualized setup for both stills and video, and so even assigning custom buttons and things like that to different functions for the two different things. So that's always a welcome thing on that front. The final dial is the one that I consider to be fairly indispensable, and that is an exposure compensation dial that is very, very useful in a lot of different settings. Outside of that, control, control scheme comes around to a front and a back wheel that are clickable, and so that gives you one more kind of custom button. There's a custom button, a couple of, or should say two custom buttons on the front that can be uh, customized to different functionality. You do have kind of a Fuji unique feature in that you have a dial that allows you to switch between manual focus, continuous autofocus, or single shot autofocus. And then on the back, the control scheme is identical with the same placement of buttons, all of which can be customized. 
There are, however, two differences that I do want to highlight between the X-T5 and the X-T4. They may not be positive differences for many of you. First of all, we have, on the X-T4, we move towards the fully articulating screen that allows you to be able to, you know, view at more angles, even to front monitor the camera. That continues to be the standard on the X-H2. But here we have reverted back to the tilting screen, which can tilt on two axes, but to me is a much more restrictive screen option than the fully articulating. Though there is some difference on that, and some, some of you prefer the tilt screen, and I recognize that. Uh, one thing that all of us can agree on is that it is an improvement when it comes to its resolution. It is now up to 1.84 million dots, and so a little bit more resolution on the monitor. We always like that. The other uh, kind of unique difference here is that the X-T4 and uh, bo bodies before that did offer a um, battery grip, like a vertical battery grip integration. The X-T5 is designed to where it doesn't even have the contacts for a battery grip. None is offered and probably none will be offered because of that. And I think that that has to do with the fact that there just wasn't enough sales for it. And so we do have a grip extender option for those of you that want a little bit more to grab. But if you want a integrated battery grip, again, you're going to have to go back to the X-H2, which does offer that. We do have the same battery pack as before, the NPW235. Now, because of you know improved efficiencies, it, you can get up to 740 max shots in eco mode. And so a little bit more in terms of that. Actually, I found battery life to be really, really good um, in my tests at this, this point. And so I think that uh, Fuji's doing a great job on that front. Also improved is the in-body image stabilization, which was new on the X-T4 and improved here from a rated 6.5 stops to a rated 7 stops. And so I did find that the it worked very well either for providing good stability for handheld video work, which is always very welcome, and then of course a lot of stability for, uh, for still shots as well. Though I will note that there is a practical limitation. You know, they say up to 7 stops with the 35mm uh, f1.4. Well, if you, if you do the math, that should allow you to handhold shots near the, almost to the four second range. I am very skeptical that anybody is going to pull that off. And so I think that there is a practical limit for some of these ratings. They're more useful, I think, not in these, those extreme scenarios, but more in just providing quality stabilization for any lens that you put in front of the camera um, in a wide variety of situations. And I think that Fuji's doing a great job with its stability. I think that that's something that they've done quite well um, all along, wh whether it started with lens stabilization and then moving on to in-camera stabilization. We also have the same port setup as before, which means that you know the primary thing that is our primary things I should say that are missing is a, a dedicated headphone jack. You would have to use a USB-C dongle to uh, allow for that. Um, and then the other thing that is missing is a full-size HDMI port for those of you that you know really prefer that for video output. And I will note that once again, uh, the XH2 has both of those features. Uh, this is a thoroughly weather sealed body. It has 56 different seal points. Um, these Fuji bodies are really, really nicely made. There's kind of a retro vibe to them that, you know, either some people will love all of the analog type controls on here. Other people will would prefer things just be done through the menu. And I think that, again, Fuji has created some of that market separation and that some other models have a simplified control scheme uh, that you can choose. In this case, it's the retro vibe, retro look, and uh, either you love it or you hate it. But it certainly is something that is distinct to here. And I'm more on the, the end of, of loving it. I like having the physical controls, though I will say uh, I don't find that the actual control dial for shutter speed to be all that useful. Um, it just allows you full stops. It's, it's just to me, it's just not the most logical way of, of approaching that. But of course, again, your mileage may vary at that point. Unfortunately, another thing that is retained here, even though we have moved to a much higher resolution point, is that we are still limited to two UHS-2 rated SD slots. And so that means that there is a bandwidth bottleneck when it comes to the memory storage. And we're going to see that that shows up negatively when it comes to the buffer depth because we've got larger file sizes. We've still got the limiting principle of the SD cards. And as a byproduct of that, we are having uh, some severe limitations when it comes to the buffer depth. In fact, 
the buffer depth is as low as only 19 uncompressed raw files. And so obviously there's going to be some variance whether you're, sh you're choosing uh, uncompressed raw or lossless compressed or compressed or JPEG or uh, HEIF, all different f file formats that are available here. And so your, your you know, buffer depth is going to depend upon the file size that you are sending through the pipeline. But if you're wanting uncompressed raws, your limit is 19 and your maximum is 119 when it comes to JPEG. So even if you're shooting like lossless compressed raw, which is kind of my preferred file format on cameras like this, you're talking about 22 um, frames before the buffer starts to fill and the camera slows down. So that's obviously going to be a limiting factor here. And again, if you compare to the X-H2, uh, which now offers CF Express Type B, it can get up to 400 of those uncompressed RAWs compared to the 19 here. That's a pretty huge difference if you're looking to do action type photography. Now, other things are really positive when it comes to the autofocus and the tracking capabilities, the shutter rate. You can do up to 15 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and up to 20, though interestingly not 30 here um, with the electronic shutter shutter, but that does come in that sports crop mode, which is an additional 1.29 times crop factor. And so it's a little bit smaller a file and thus, you know, makes the file, file size smaller, which allows them to, you know, push that through a little bit more. With the mechanical shutter, you can get up to one eight thousandth of a second, but with the electronic shutter, you can now get up to a ridiculous one one hundred and eighty thousandth of a second shutter speed, though you have to have pretty ideal conditions to get up to a shutter speed that fast. So very good chance it's probably not going to be a real world factor too many times uh, for you at that point. The focus system is, for the most part, similar, though with a, a few extra bells and whistles. It is still kind of the basic hybrid uh, focus system that is a combination of phase detect overlaid over supporting contrast AF. We have 425 selectable AF points that cover you know, most of the height of the sensor, not quite all of the width of the sensor, as you can see here. But what we do have is the newest focus algorithms, we have faster processing, and we also now have deep learning AI for predictive tracking and and so that's going to help in a lot of tracking scenarios and there's also a bigger diversity of what can be tracked through the learning AI and so it's not just human eyes now but it is animals birds cars motorcycles bicycles airplanes and trains so there's a good chance that whatever action subject you want to track the camera is going to be capable of doing that now unfortunately for this particular review I not only reviewed in the dead of winter but also in a series of winter storms and so my uh, tracking opportunities uh, have been more limited in this particular review. I did shoot some basketball in a gym, though I was using the 100 to 400 millimeter lens, which is not a fast lens in terms of aperture. By the way, this new 150 to 600 millimeter, it's an awesome lens in many ways, but once again, uh, in terms of the aperture, it's not particularly fast. It's a slow lens. And so uh, that's not an ideal scenario for lenses like that in a you know not particularly well lit indoor gym setting. But I was able to freeze action just fine, though it means boosting the ISO to get the shutter speed necessary for that. But what I, I could see just in kind of general use was the fact that there is a definite improvement to IAF detection. Um, there's, you know, more confident focus in general. There's more confident video performance, which includes smoother focus pulls. And I tested that using this new 30 millimeter F2.8 macro. It does have a linear motor. And so um, I, I saw basically as good as what I've ever seen on Fuji. I used to see a lot of visible steps in uh, video focus pools, particularly with lenses without the linear motors. And so it is just, it's good to see Fuji continuing to improve in that point. I saw better IEF stickiness and better overall accuracy results though. I would still say that I slightly favor Canon and Sony in that regard. Uh, the tech just seems to be just a little bit more refined in that point. One thing I will say about the focus system is I still don't necessarily love the whole whole frame tracking uh, scenario in terms of the visibility there. Even if you select the whole frame, you're still left with that green box that you kind of need to start getting that on your subject, which almost feels like a focus and re recompose type scenario, though while you're on the subject, it'll start to move around and track with the subject. I just, uh, I, I don't love that. And unless, you know, the, the system has an eye to grab, it's going to, you know, require you to do a little bit of kind of manually moving that around. And I do prefer both Canon and Sony's ability to just kind of 
intuitively grab the most logical focus subject, and then you can overwrite if necessary. And and so um, in this case, it's kind of the reverse. And again, uh, if you if you once you get accustomed to it, it works just fine. But it's just it's not my preferred process. Overall, however, some solid moves forward when it comes to the overall autofocus performance. And I definitely saw that when it came to video as well. Now on the video front, we can now record up to 6.2K at 30 frames per second. Again, the X-H2 can record up to 8K, but here we're capped out at 6.2K, 30 frames per second. In 4K, you can do up to 60 frames per second. In Full HD, you can get as fast as 240 frames per second. A lot of different bit rates are available, um, and so there's a lot of flexibility built into the system. Also important, you now have access to F-Log2 as a profile, not just F-Log, but F-Log2, which increases the headroom of the dynamic range. Over 13 stops of dynamic range available for editing and F-Log2. Also, you can now output ProRes and Blackmagic RAW video over HDMI, which, you know, all of those are going to be, you know, more upscale video features that are going to be welcome. And I will also note that the improved in-body image stabilization means that it's easier than ever to get running gun uh, video performance and, uh, and footage just looks generally great. Good color science, very good detail, all of those things that I think are important. So let's talk about this new sensor. This is the headline, obviously, and uh, in, in my opinion, it is a, a great move by Fuji. They've developed a great sensor here that adds a lot of the uh, flexibility of improved resolution, but without a whole lot of liabilities attached to it. And so let's dive into a deep dive of that and just see what they've accomplished here. So first of all, we have a new base ISO here for this 40 megapixel sensor. So rather than 160 being the base ISO, we now can go as low as 125 in the native range. Now that does give us a bit of an advantage because it does expand the native ISO range. Now, if we compare, um, you know, ISO 125 with ISO 160, you know, there's not really necessarily any difference to see here other than the fact that it does give us a little more shutter flexibility and also it's going to allow in certain, you know, lighting conditions just a little bit more flexibility when it comes to that base ISO performance. But as I kind of pan around and have looked at this, it's not like I can really tell a difference between the two. Now, as we start to move up the ISO range, I am going to skip over a few stops in between in that we, I find that these days, anything ISO 800 and below, you really don't see any difference. And so I'll start here at ISO 16 or 1600, I should say. And frankly, you know, as I have come to expect from modern cameras, there really isn't much of anything to see even at ISO 1600. You can see that there is the very faintest beginnings of a little bit of pattern noise, but the blacks are still very inky. You can see that uh, our contrast is largely the same. Performance is very, very similar, and in terms of our color swatches, they all look basically identical. Now at ISO 3200 is really where I feel like I start to see just a the beginnings of the kind of image quality degradation that's going to come as you continue to climb up the ISO range. And so that takes the form here in that you can just see there's a little bit more pattern noise along this area, where, whereas at the base ISO, this is all really, really clean. You can also see that the black here, it is not quite as inky black. So you are starting to lose a, uh, some dynamic range by this point. There's a little bit of pattern noise inside there on the uh, the mirror inside the SLR and if we look up in this area you can see that just kind of this black area isn't quite as smooth some visible noise there and there's a little bit of pattern noise over the color swatches and the colors aren't quite as intense still however looking at the image globally ISO 3200 looks really really clean so let's compare it as we continue to climb up starting at ISO 6400 you can see that kind of the things, the patterns that we saw beginning at ISO 3200 are carried a step further. At 6400, there's definitely some more visible noise. If we go down into this area on the table, we can just see that the noise pattern is rougher and we can see that uh, the black of the kind of the completely dark area is not quite as inky black at 6400 as it was at 3200. This pattern is repeated over here on this side. And also I would say that because of the rising noise level and less uh, dynamic range colors are a little bit less intense. Still, however, I would say for many settings, a usable image at 6400. If we compare that same 3200 to 12800 though, we see that things are starting to change more dramatically here. Noise pattern is much rougher. And then we can also see here we have got 
just kind of those indiscriminately brightly lit pixels that start to really raise the black levels and make them not nearly as inky. You can see it in here where the pattern noise is much rougher. And if we look up in this area here, we can see in the color swatches that, um, you know, there's, there's much more, you know, pattern noise. Also, the colors aren't as intense. What I am not necessarily seeing is a banding of color or a shift, color shift towards uh, something discolored. So overall, I would say color fidelity is pretty decent. It's just that color levels aren't as saturated due to the rising noise. Now, 12,800 is the end of the native ISO range. However, there are two expanded settings at 25,600 and uh, ISO 52,000 and, uh, and 52,200. And we can see here that as we go into that expanded range, basically all the symptoms we saw at the you know peak of the native performance are just exaggerated at 25,600. Um, image quality definitely starting to really fall apart. And that's even worse if we move on up to 51,200, which I would consider consider unusable. Um, just the, you know, you've lost your, your contrast basically altogether. There's a very, very slight magenta shift here, but that's not really the problem. Biggest problem is that the noise now is, is quite visible, even at a global level. Contrast levels aren't nearly as good. Whereas at 12,800, I wouldn't consider it necessarily usable at a pixel level, but at a global level, yeah, it's still quite usable. 6,400, easily usable. And ISO 3,200, you can use it without too much of a penalty. So in our next series, we'll start to look at dynamic range and we'll start with shadow recovery. So this is going to be our base exposure here. And on the right, you can see it is now underexposed by one stop. And so what we'll show is the uh, underexposure and then the recovery and how cleanly it's happening. So obviously with just this one stop of underexposure, kind of recovering all of that is effortless. Um, everything looks very, very clean. And as you start to pull back those shadows, uh, you're able to do it without any kind of apparent noise. It all looks really, really clean. Two stops recovery, you can see the underexposure is more pronounced, but you can also see that uh, just adding those two stops of exposure back in post, you're able to do that without any kind of issue. Uh, dynamic range looks good. Detail looks good. We're not really introducing any kind of visible noise here. Everything is nice and clean. At three stops, uh, the story remains the same. We're able to recover the colors without issue. We're able to recover the information that had been crushed and lost before. Uh, down, now we're to the place where the pattern of the checkerboard is almost completely lost. We're able to recover that with only the tiniest bit of additional noise as a part of the recovery. Now at four stops of underexposure, you can see that a lot of information here on the left has been lost. And so if we take a look, for example, at the grip on the SLR, you can see it's recovered nicely. I don't see any color shift there. And down here, there's just a little tiny bit of noise, but we're recovering information that was completely crushed and lost and recovering it quite cleanly. And even if we look up here on the divider portion, which was again, almost completely crushed, we can see that that information has been recovered cleanly. I don't see any kind of band and no discoloration, a very nice performance. So even if we push that to five stops of recovery, I don't think that the recovery is, as far as the colors here, is quite as smooth. There's a little bit of discoloration and more visible noise that is there. But in general, you're getting most of that information back. And here in the battery grip and inside the SLR, um, there's just a, a slight bit of discoloration and a little bit more visible noise. But by and large, it is recovered quite nicely. So a good strong performance there for shadow recovery. Now, typically cameras don't do as well with highlight recovery, and so we'll test to see how the X-T5 does on that. So first of all, at one stop of overexposure, and again, we're drawing that exposure back on the right side, we can see that, you know, kind of the blown out areas on the timer face, it's very consistently recovered, no issues there. Uh, you know, kind of blown out areas on the camera face, recovered nicely. And then in our color swatches already, you know, some of these colors have started to be lost, kind of the peaches there, but we can see that they've been pulled back and recovered just fine uh, with the highlight recovery. Now at two stops of recovery, um, we can see a lot of information was blown out. And so as far as the timer face goes, no problems there, doing a good job there. I would say just a tiny bit of texture information has been lost on the Honeywell Pentax area. And we can also see looking up here, we have lost for the most part some of that peach color, but by and large, the other colors that were starting to disappear have been pulled back pretty nicely there on the right side and here on the far left as well. So still a fairly decent performance at two stops. 
Now at three stops of overexposure, you can see that even at a global level, there's some information that has been lost here. And so we can see that on the timer face, it's not an even coloration. Looking here on the SLR, we can see that, you know, there's a lot of information, texture information that has been lost and not recovered. And we can also see, for example, here that, you know, only the, the frame is left. Some of this color has been lost and is not fully recovered. And, uh, and so we can see that things are starting to fall apart there at three stops of overexposure. And at four stops of overexposure, you can basically forget about it. I mean, what has been lost here, it just is not going to be recovered in any kind of natural way at all. That being said, Fuji does have a couple of tricks up its sleeve. The first of those is if you move up to ISO uh, 250, you have the ability to go into DR200. And so basically, what, as you can see here, we have had the ability to now pull the highlights from a one stop lower. And so basically, while this is a three stop uh, overexposure here, the highlights are basically the like a two stop overexposure. And so as a byproduct, as we saw before, you're able to recover that information quite well. And so it gives you a little bit more headroom there. Likewise, if you move up to ISO 500, as we have here, you're getting even more of that headroom. And so now again, three stop exposure, but or overexposure, but because the highlights are now sampled from the base ISO, that's actually two stops more. And so now we see something that is as clean as basically like the one stop of overexposure when it comes to the highlights. And as a byproduct of that, everything is just you know, perfectly natural. We even got that peach color that we saw was lost at two stops of overexposure typically. And so uh, I, with Fuji cameras, I almost always utilize this if I'm in a setting where I'm getting higher, um, I, you know, needing to shoot at slightly higher ISOs anyway, because it gives you that advantage of just having more dynamic range in a single shot. Now, also extremely useful, obviously, is the added resolution here. And so if we zoom into a pixel level on this, we can see that there is some deep cropping capabilities available at this 40 plus megapixels of resolution. And so can you imagine, you know, for again, looking at this for macro type work that, you know, how much additional, you know, cropping and kind of thus zooming capability is available in that because of the resolution. Likewise, here in this portrait shot, this is at f1.2 and it's from my Viltrox. 75 millimeter f1.2 review and so here I was very easily able to take it into this crop that I really really liked with tons of resolution for printing left and even if I crop right in tight to show off how well focused it was you can see that even on my 4k monitor that I'm sampling right now there's enough resolution that this isn't falling apart here and so obviously that deep cropping capability is going to be extremely useful. Likewise here, if we take a look at this landscape type shot, the ability to deeply crop into images like this is going to be really, really useful. So let's say, for example, I take this crop right here. Well, there's still a lot of resolution, enough for a printing here at this point, but what we can see also is that I'm able to really, really alter from the original how much uh, information is on display there. And, you know, I could even crop over on this side to kind of get a sense of the draw into the distance. And again, I've got a beautiful end result here simply because there is a lot of extra flexibility there for the cropping. That's obviously going to be useful for a lot of things up to including uh, pulling distant wildlife closer and having that ability to crop in and still have usable resolution. So in conclusion, this is a camera that has a great sensor and obviously it has a fairly mature feature set at this point through the years of evolution, five generations now in the X-T series. And I think that it shows in the overall polish of the camera. You know, it's... It's not to say that it's a, a home run in the sense of when I look across the market. Ergonomically, I still prefer the Canon R7 and its overall tracking capabilities. But it has the, you know, the Canon RF has almost no APS-C lenses. And so as a system, it's not nearly as desirable as what Fuji has to offer at this point. I still prefer the overall autofocus performance of Sony bodies, but at this stage, their bodies are outdated and are in desperate need of an update. So I think the Fuji in many ways has the best all-round APS-C ecosystem that is, I think, 
tremendously helped by the fact that they have opened it up to third-party development. And in 2022, we have seen a lot of new lenses that are coming, have been previously released on other systems that are now coming over to uh, Fuji. You know, lenses from Tamron and from Sigma, from Samyang, um, the Viltrox 75mm f1.2, a fantastic lens that I just recently reviewed on this camera. Uh, you know, and so I think that that helps to make the whole system more attractive and it removes one of the built-in advantages that, say, Sony had previously and certainly gives Fuji an advantage over, a further advantage over Canon and their recent delving into, uh, you know, mirrorless APS-C with the RF mount. And so there is a, a lot of good things going on. The Fuji uh, X-T5 has a great retro vibe and if you like, you know, manual controls, it's got a great assortment of that. I think, as you've probably noticed in my references throughout this review, the greatest competition may come from Fuji itself in the form of the X-H2, which costs about $300 more, but it has more upscale video features, it has much deeper buffers, has the fully articulating LCD screen that was lost off the X-T5. And so in many ways, I think that if you are looking to do either sports, you should consider the X-H2, and if you're serious about video, you probably also should consider the X-H2 for a variety of reasons. And so, uh, you know, for about $300 more, that's not a huge difference when you're talking about the difference between $1,700 and $2,000. I think that it should give at least some photographers a, you know, a serious pause considering what is going to work best for their purposes. At the end of the day, however, the X-T5 is a very solid camera and an improvement upon the X-T4 in a number of ways, most notably in that incredible new sensor, which offers the current highest resolution that I think you can find on the APS-C format. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage there to my full text review, also to my image gallery. There are buying links there, and uh, beyond that link is to follow myself or Craig on social media, to become a patron, or to support this channel by purchasing channel merchandise. And of course, as always, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, and let the light in.